Hi, it's Friday, July 5th, still tracking Hurricane Barrel, now over the Yucatan Peninsula of eastern Mexico, came in just south of Cozumel, a little bit farther north than forecast a day or two ago, uh, so it spared Chetumal in areas of northern Belize, really no core impacts there, but it increased the impacts to areas like Playa del Carmen and Cozumel, where damage has been reported, and we hope everyone is staying safe today and that the recovery process is safe and smooth. Tropical storm conditions likely continuing inland as the remnant core continues across the landmass. It'll spend about 12 hours over land. Exactly how much depends on whether it reaches the northwestern corner or shortcuts a little bit to the northern coast. Still watching for that. It seems like it might be going for this section of the coastline right here. Uh, but that process over land will cause the core to continue decaying, and we will see a significantly weaker storm, likely below hurricane strength, when it reemerges over the water here later tonight. This is the Cancun radar picture showing that there is some of the core remaining, but you can see it's much weaker on the western and southern side now, and there's not really an eye wall to speak of, just this band of deep convection as the storm loses its oceanic fuel source for several hours here, and the added friction from the landmass causes a spin down of the circulation as it rubs up against the ground during the land crossing. And what Barrel's going to be fighting with, even beyond the landmass itself, is this upper level low that is still sitting here to its west, and it is moving away from Barrel, but Barrel's kind of chasing it and staying in proximity. This upper low is generating southwesterly flow aloft that is kind of Com continuing to impinge upon Barrel's circulation, and Barrel has been resisting that wind shear uh, pretty efficiently over the last couple of days, but now that the vortex is becoming more vulnerable due to its crossing of the landmass, it may not be as vertically coherent and stable anymore, and so the same amount of shear may be able to find more success at disrupting Barrel's structure and causing asymmetries after it emerges over the gulf. Most models kind of expect that now, if we look at the HAPS B high resolution hurricane model from NOAA, you'll see this example as it comes out over the Gulf. This upper level low is still here, so there's some southerly flow continuing to hit barrel from the south side. And if we look at the structure in the mid level moisture field, you'll see that it's mostly dry on the southern side, and the surface circulation location is within that dry air with all of the thunderstorms and moisture offset to the north side by that southerly shear indicating significant asymmetry and tilting of the vortex on the model. So this is a pretty weak system as it comes off the Yucatan. GFS is a similar story here coming off, showing this kind of structure where the surface center is tilted to the southeast of the mid-level center, and again, all of that moisture sheared off onto the north side. But what you'll notice on both models is that conditions do get more favorable over time as this upper level low weakens and backs away, and so as the storm comes toward the northwest, conditions will progressively get less hostile. The upper level wind becomes lighter. You'll see more white here, less blue as it gets close to the western Gulf Coast on Saturday night, Sunday morning, and there's also some additional poleward outflow channel that opens up into this jet stream over the central U.S. We have this trough digging down which is going to help usher it toward the north, but also could provide poleward exhaust for upper-level outflow to leave the system that promotes upper-level divergence and the development of concentrated thunderstorm activity in the storm core. And so those two things together, the increased outflow and lessening shear, could result in re-intensification of the system, especially in its final hours on approach to the coastline. And if we look at the modeling, we do in fact see that. I might have spoiled it earlier with the the frames being offset, but you can see the symmetrization that occurs in the mid-level moisture field, so it goes from asymmetric to symmetric again, and then in the final hours before landfall we see pretty intense deepening actually back into a hurricane strength system on the HAFS B, and on the GFS a similar process occurs where it struggles for the first day over the Gulf, and then it symmetrizes at the last minute and really deepens on its final approach to the Texas coastline where you see a more established inner core and a more hurricane-like structure. And you can see that we're talking about Texas again here, and this is because the track has trended a little bit toward the north. We talked in yesterday's video about how the risks were increasing to Texas due to the northward tendency in Barrel's short-term track, and we are seeing that bear out today. 24 hours ago, most of the tracks were straddling the Rio Grande with some south of the Texas-Mexico border, 
others to the north of the border, but today they're predominantly north of the border. That doesn't mean that northern Mexico can't still get the landfall. It certainly could, especially if Beryl emerges closer to this corner of the northwestern Yucatan Peninsula. But if, he, if it emerges along the northern coastline of the Yucatan, most modeling agrees this is probably Texas bound now at this point. And you can see that it will be turning to the north around the time of landfall. This could come into play later because unfortunately the coastline is shaped roughly south to north here. And if the storm starts paralleling the coastline, that means that any little twitch to the left or the right could radically change the exact point along this section of coastline where Barrel Center makes landfall. And so in terms of who gets the maximum storm surge and wind threats, uh, that could be determined by last minute shifts in the track. And we may not be able to easily nail down the exact landfall point here with, preci with precision. And there will be some uncertainty probably right up until the final day or half day before landfall. And in terms of the upper and mid Texas coast, there may still be some risk here as well. This is the GFS ensemble showing some members do make it beyond Matagorda Bay farther up the coastline, especially those that depart the Yucatan Peninsula farther to the north. They end up farther east at landfall, and that's, that's a possibility here. We're going to be keeping an eye on Barrel's core and where exactly it emerges. It could be over here, could be over here. That will determine a lot for us. And in general, there's still some wiggle room again with this turn, its timing, and the shape of the coastline. Don't assume that there's no risk in the upper half of the Texas coastline either. So I would be getting prepared for a potential hurricane to be moving into anywhere along the south, central, and eastern Texas Gulf Coast just in case we see further shifts. There's no guarantee we'll see the track continue shifting to the right, but there may still be some room for that. There is a limit on how far right it can shift. I mean, it's really not going to go into Louisiana. There's no guidance that suggests that. The ridge over the southeastern U.S. kind of sets the edge here, and this would have to be emerging much farther north than it currently is in order to threaten something like Louisiana. But we could see some storm surge risk as onshore flow, especially if the system is near the central Texas coastline. We could still get southerly winds piling up some water along the coastline, and we'll see when the storm surge watches come out. Uh, who is vulnerable to that, but typically this part of the Gulf Coast, it's very easy to get oceanic water level rise due to onshore flow. So be aware of those risks even well east of the storm center as it comes up. This is the European model 500 millibar chart showing that by Saturday night, uh, this ridge over the southeastern U.S. has started to weaken a little bit. It is guiding the storm toward the northwest, but there's this weakness that develops over Texas and Oklahoma due to this broad smiley faced upper level trough in the jet stream that is going to guide this storm toward maybe the north northwest by the time of landfall. So we continue to see this gradual turn and you can see that on the European model, it moves north at the last second and ends up near Corpus Christi. And it, you notice that it, it came right up to the Rio Grande here before making that turn. So again, this north south shaped coastline is problematic. It could easily make landfall here or here or here. There's a fair bit that can happen even with just a couple dozen miles of shift left or right in the track. So be prepared in general for a hurricane to be moving into this area. The system will likely be pretty weak upon exiting the Yucatan, uh, but it's likely to re-strengthen and we could see a hurricane again. Probably not you know, anything like what we saw in the Caribbean, a category four and five hurricane. That's not really the base case here, uh, but a hurricane with winds greater than 75 miles per hour certainly on the table here and we could see hurricane watches for portions of this coastline before very long from the national hurricane center speaking of nhc this is their current official forecast as of 10 a.m central time friday no watches yet along the coastline but you can see they do forecast re-intensification into a hurricane that's what the letter h means re-intensifying into a hurricane prior to making landfall just north of Brownsville on this particular forecast. But again, you can see that even a slight shift to the right or to the left could greatly change the landfall location along northern Mexico or south central Texas. And again, keep an eye even in mid to upper Texas coastline, just in case we see additional shifts. We really can't fully rule that out just yet. And rain and storm surge impacts will extend well to the north and east of the storm center, even if the storm makes landfall farther south 
in southern Texas. And it could be slowing down just a little bit during this turn. So we are concerned about maybe flash flooding as this comes in. There could be a day plus of solid rain. Uh, some folks may need that to alleviate the drought, but you don't want 10 inches of rain in a day. That's always going to cause issues in some vulnerable areas. So keep an eye out for that, even if you're not in a storm surge prone area or near the eye wall at the time of landfall and vulnerable to wind, there could still be inland flooding due to the rain as well. So we'll keep an eye out for those hazards. No watches and warnings just yet, but likely coming out soon. This is the official arrival time expectation, earliest reasonable arrival time. It could be 8 a.m. Sunday on this current official forecast. That's when the first tropical storm force winds would likely arrive. And the actual landfall time would likely be earlier if it's down here and then later if it gets farther up the coast because there would be more travel time over water the farther north it goes. That could also matter later because the more time over water it has, uh, the stronger it could become just because it has more time over water. So those are details we'll be watching as we head into the weekend. But in general, expect a hurricane to be moving into this region and be prepared accordingly just in case, and pay attention to your local officials and weather service forecast offices for the latest information on your locale. That'll be about it for this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll do my best to have another tomorrow.